start our meeting now. And, uh, I think we have everyone here. Um, first of all, we would like to welcome you, many of you on Zoom today, to attend this meeting, um, this side event organized by the Gulf Center for Human Rights and the World Organization Against Torture, or MCC. During this event, we will address the systematic use of torture in Bahrain, Syria, Syria, Iraq, and Saudi Arabia. My name is Riam Youssef, and I am the Women Human Rights Defenders Program Manager at the Gulf Center for Human Rights. And I'll be moderating this event along with my colleague Gerard from the OMCC. But before starting uh, with the house rules, I would like to remind you that this session is recorded and it will be available on social media. Unfortunately, we cannot let today pass without remembering our colleague, Ala Sadiq, the Executive Director of Southwest. Um, I would like to invite all of you um, to take a moment of silence. Um, just to remember her, remember her work and all her efforts. So if we can just pay her a moment of silence now. Thank you. I think it's very important that we remember her today. Um, she's a fierce Emirati woman human rights defender, a young soul that gave a lot to the cause, working tirelessly to defend human rights and the rights of all detainees, including her father. Now back to the house rules. By the end of this session, if you have any question or comment, please feel free to raise your hand and send them here on the chat box. We would like also to ask you kindly to speak clearly and reasonably um, to allow the interpreter to do the translation as accurately as promptly as possible. Also, if possible, please use one language at a time. Mixing two languages can be confusing for some of the participants and the interpreter. We would like also to remind you to keep your microphone on mute all times, unless you were asked to speak by the moderator. Interpretation is available in Arabic and English during this session. And if you require interpretation, please press on the button below on the right side to enable Arabic or English challenge. We would like to apologize for any technical difficulties we may face. At times of COVID-19, we attempted to master digital skills, yet there's always room for um, some challenges. Um, today's session is on torture. As we said before, the use of torture is everlasting and it leaves the scars on body and mind of the victims and their families. Governments have always used the torture in many forms and for various reasons. And for us, this has been always a challenge within the human rights work. In 2011, when the Arab uprising unfolded, in most of these countries, the use of torture becomes systematic by governments in the Middle East and North Africa. Despite their ratification to the Convention Against Torture, the targeted countries intensified the use of torture and forced and increased the crackdown on any voices that would, ask, that would be speaking against them or be critical to their policies. Having said that, I would like to welcome our first speaker, Mr. Nels Moser, the UN Special Rapporteur on Torture, to give us a layout on torture and his mandate that falls within the same context. Mr. Nels. Thank you very much. Uh, how is the audio? Can you hear me? Yes? Okay. Right. Um, thank you very much uh, to the Gulf Center and the OMCT for having uh, organized this, um, this, this side event. And I, I think it's, it's, it's extremely important that we address now uh, this week, this is the week which will end you know, the 26th of June. Uh, which is the Torture Victims Day. 
uh, I think it is particularly um, fitting that in this week we address uh, the use of torture for the suppression of dissidents in the Gulf region. Now, as you know, as the Special Rapporteur of the United Nations on torture and, and other cruel and human or degrading treatment or punishment, I, my mandate is a global one. I, I cover all UN member states and even aspiring UN member states. And so um, at, on the occasion of the 70th anniversary of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, um, in, in uh, uh, two years ago, I, I submitted a report and I analyzed how far we have come since the end of the Second World War worldwide. Um, and clearly, and I'm, I'm saying this because it has a significance for the region that we're addressing here, um, that worldwide we have established a very sophisticated normative framework. Uh, there is universal recognition uh, that torture and ill treatment, other forms of ill treatment are absolutely prohibited. It's an absolute prohibition. It's a non-derogable prohibition, which means there cannot be in normal times any exceptions, no justifications for it. And even in times of crisis, you cannot derogate in any form from, deviate from, from this uh, prohibition. There cannot be any situation where torture could ever be uh, lawful, justifiable, um, and 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 in, in that sense uh, that it could not be a crime. So that it's, I'm saying this, I'm emphasizing this because it's very rare that we have crimes, offenses that are universally through all cultures, through all continents, uh, through all language barriers, religious barriers, everywhere it is recognized that torture is cr uh, crossing a red line. Uh, we can't do it. On the other hand, and that's the most troubling piece of the truth, is that it is practiced everywhere. Everywhere in all regions of the world, torture happens as a matter of fact. And this discrepancy between the aspiration and the commitment of states and the actual practice, I think uh, is, is, is very, very troubling. And we urgently need to address this. And this is also what brings me now to this region where I feel this is a particularly affected region where we have this discrepancy. Because these states, they're bound, that we're addressing here, they're bound by, uh, by the prohibition against torture. Uh, and still, and, 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 and for me, this is very, very valuable to have this report and I'm, I'm not going to be long now because I would like to listen to what the other speakers have to say about this region, particularly because in all the countries that we're talking about here, the six countries, I have uh, uh, tried to visit or try to uh, at least understand um, uh, better what, what the actual root causes of, of torture and ill treatment are. Um, I have not been able to visit any of those countries so far. Um, in my, I've submitted communications on all of them, uh, individual communications. As you know, I can, I can intervene with governments on behalf of individual victims. Um, I will quickly take through, through those six countries and uh, give some short explanations as, as to the perspective of my mandate. Um, and then also identify some common uh, issues that I'm sure will then also be reflected in the, uh, the presentations of the other speakers. In Bahrain, I, during my mandate, which started in uh, 2016, so this is now my fifth year, uh, in the last five years, I have submitted three visit requests to Bahrain and have not even received a response to my requests. Uh, previous mandate holders have tried to visit uh, uh, in Bahrain in 2012 and 2013, but at the last moment before they were able to travel there, the government postponed the visits. During my five, five years as the Special Rapporteur, I have submitted 20 communications to Bahrain um, and uh, that speak basically all to the same issues that I will then also identify with through the, at the end with regard to the other countries. Uh, Iraq, Iraq is the only of those countries that has actually invited me and uh, to visit. And that was just now in March, 2021, which I think is a very, very positive step in the right direction. And I intend to take it up uh, with the authorities to, to try to see that I can visit Iraq perhaps next year uh, on an official country visit. That would be in a very important step uh, in the right direction. During my tenure, I have 
uh, um, made four communica 14 communications to uh, Iraq. And uh, Saudi Arabia, I did two visit requests and did not receive any response, but submitted 25 communications to Saudi Arabia. Um, the, uh, the Emirates also, I did um, two visit requests uh, and received an acknowledgement of receipt, but no uh, substantive response. So no invitation, but submitted 13 communications. And now the two other, the last countries, Syria and Yemen are particular to, for my mandate because they're areas of war. And uh, this is sometimes misunderstood and sometimes criticized because I don't, uh, I, I don't intervene or I, I'm not trying to visit Syria or Yemen, although torture is rampant in these countries because of the, the conflict uh, context. I think there it's important to understand as a special rapporteur with the very limited resources I have um, to go and try to analyze a, um, a um, uh, very strongly destabilized situation of ongoing uh, armed conflict is very, very difficult. There are other organizations that are much better placed to do that. I used to work for the uh, uh, in International Committee of the Red Cross as a delegate for 12 years, and that's the type of organization that has the presence and has the staff and has the means to uh, come back with a report that is realistic. I fear that if I visited one of those two countries, my report would not, I would have so many difficulties actually accessing places where torture happens, that I will come back with a report that doesn't reflect reality, and then that would not be um, would not be helpful to the victims either. So it is, it is important to understand that if I'm hesitant to intervene in, in, in states where there is an ongoing armed conflict, it is because of the sheer size of the problem and the impossibility to objectively evaluate those problems and because other actors are better placed. But so um, in all those countries, uh, we see that there is a persistent lack of due process uh, that we have arbitrary use of anti-terrorism legislations uh, used to be to convict opposition, uh, you know, uh, 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 dissidents or human rights defenders. Um, we have the use of torture to extract uh, forced confessions. Uh, we have uh, uh, the application of the death penalty uh, as a threat scenario uh, in order to enforce, uh, you know, con uh, uh, confessions, but also as a as as a punishment, which also, in my view. Uh, is a violation already of the prohibition of torture and ill treatment and of clearly also affects the right to life. Um, we have the lack of independent investigations of allegations of torture and ill treatment. That's very important because we're talking here about the lack of accountability. And that leads to that persistent culture of impunity. It's not the only region in the world where this is a problem, but it is a particular problem in this region. Uh, accountability is such an important missing piece in the international framework today that I have dedicated my upcoming report to the General Assembly that I will present in October to the General Assembly in New York. Uh, I have dedicated it to the topic of accountability because you can have the best laws, you can have had the best regulations, but if you don't have accountability for violating uh, those, those laws and, and regulations, then in effect, we always have a downward spiral into complete arbitrariness and a culture of impunity. Unfortunately, I believe today that's the situation we have in these states. Now, I will not take more time because we have limited speaking time. Um, I would like to listen uh, to the other speakers. I will be with you. Uh, for at least another hour and i'd be also happy obviously to respond to any questions anybody might have thank you very much thank you mr melzer i think you raised very important uh, point about accountability impunity and persistence of use of force um, um and the use of torture uh, in many forms and, and in many ways um as with extract force confession as you said and punishment but i think in light of lack of access we um, appreciate the, the reports coming from the, these organizations, our partners, for contributing. And now let me invite um, our next speaker, Asma Darwish, uh, from the Bahrain Center for Human Rights. Uh, Asma Darwish is an advocacy officer at the Bahrain Center for Human Rights. The Bahrain Center for Human Rights is a Bahraini nonprofit, non governmental organization which works to promote human rights in Bahrain. It was founded by a member of Bahraini activists in June 20.
as long as the floor is yours. Thank, Thank you, you so, so much, Rian. Uh, is it clear? My voice? Yes, it's great. Okay, great. So, um, hello everyone. Thanks for giving me this opportunity to be talking about this important subject. Um, I was asked uh, to present the report that I worked on in BCHR, Bahrain Center for Human Rights, in cooperation with the Gulf Center for Human Rights, and it was in support of the European Union. Uh, the thematic of this report was on torture and uh, our uh, report in BCHR uh, was titled Torture is the Policy and Impunity is the Norm. And uh, in this report, uh, we talked about um, um, the, we gave a background about the situation of human rights in Bahrain. And then we talked about the uh, Bahrain's international obligations uh, regarding torture and uh, also the practices of the security agencies uh, in detention centers. And then we named uh, the officials that were involved in torture practices. And in the end of the report, we talked about and we named the victims and survivors of practices of uh, torture. And those uh, were categorized into political activists, human rights defenders, um, prisoners who are on death row uh, or have been already executed and also uh, protesters. Uh, to give more uh, context uh, to, the, um, to the report, um, in fact, it was quite hard um, to, to be interviewing people and uh, recent, I mean, recent interview interviews and recent information on torture uh, because uh, there are there are fears of reprisal uh, from inside uh, Bahrain. Um, so the information uh, we included in this report and the things that were documented uh, were already information published by investigations, by news and uh, other reports uh, on, on the matter. And those uh, documents uh, have included a UN, UN uh, text um, on, on Bahrain, uh, especially the Committee Against uh, Torture and uh, reports that were published by uh, local and international uh, partners, uh, official uh, state reports, and then of course the reports, the famous report of the Bahrain Independent Commission of Inquiry, the BICI, and also documentation, photos or video recordings, uh, whether they were publicly uh, uh, posted on the internet or where in the position of Bahrain Center for Human Rights and some uh, interviews with torture survivors and witnesses. Um, to give context to the, um, to the, to the movement uh, in Bahrain, so Bahrain has witnessed several uprisings throughout its history and the most recent one was um, in February 2018 uh, with the Arab Spring movement and uh, from from the first day of the movement uh, of 2011, uh, the Bahraini government resorted or chose to resort to force to end the peaceful uh, demonstrations, and many uh, many protests were killed uh, because of uh, brutality, uh, security forces brutality. Either it was on the street or under torture in uh, detention centers. And many cases have been documented by local and international uh, reports uh, on, on mentioning cases of torture and also ill treatment. Um, in fact, um, Bahrain has introduced uh, several reforms to address the illegal practices uh, that were committed by the uh, security forces, but uh, torture was still uh, widespread and systematic. Uh, and according to our documentation in Bahrain Center for Human Rights, almost everyone who has been uh, arrested um, as a result of the 2011 uh, popular movement was subject to different levels of ill treatment uh, during arrest, interrogation, uh, pre-trial detention, uh, or inside uh, prison. 
and uh, the, the torture practice happened uh, for several re reasons that could include uh, extracting uh, confessions uh, or uh, punishing the, the detainee or just to spread, uh, spread fear in the society. And uh, these torture were, were also physical and uh, psychological, and it was committed against uh, the detainees in different uh, police stations, uh, uh, detention centers, and uh, prisons. And also in, the, in early 2011, it was practiced in the streets. Um, and the, the, um, the torture did not spare prominent uh, opposition figures, uh, prominent human rights defenders, and in this report, uh, we detailed uh, the cases of 24 opposition figures and civil society activists, in addition to dozens of cases of convicted politi political prisoners who has been uh, already executed or are um, await awaiting uh, to be executed. They are on death row. Um, in fact, uh, the the culture of impunity uh, did not did not really help the situation in Bahrain because those who has who have uh, practiced uh, torture against detainees or protesters prisoners um, they were not held accountable. Uh, there were some um, some trials that uh, that um, took place for those who were uh, involved in torture practices, but uh, uh, those were misleading uh, trials and uh, none of them were really convicted for, for the uh, horrible uh, acts of torture they have uh, carried. Um, so um, we, we, in this report, we, we said that the impunity is, is the norm in Bahrain. Um, in fact, um, since the 20s, early 20s, uh, torture has been widespread in Bahrain. And then in the 60s, with the movement of the 60s and in the 70s, uh, many people were um, died uh, under torture in police custody. In, in the 70s, there are, um, there are uh, victims who died under torture, like, um, like Mohammed Bouchiri, uh, Saeed al rawinati and in the 80s, um, um, Jamal Asfour, um, Jamil, Jamil Ali, a lot of victims of, of torture that we have uh, detailed in our report. And we have uh, talked about the, the practices that was happening against them. Um, when we say torture, uh, we, mean, we mean acts of brutality and inhumane acts against against someone and that could be um, uh, what was what was documented in Bahrain it was uh, hitting uh, the feet with uh, rubber hoses or batons sorry for the details it might be a bit harsh uh, slapping and kicking beating them with different tools forcing detainees to stand for long periods blindfolding and handcuffing for extended periods of time uh, threatening detainees with death holding detainees in painful uh, positions, uh, hanging detainees by their hands and feet, exposure to extreme temperatures, sexual abuse and humiliation, uh, including forced nudity, um, uh, refusing to give uh, prisoners access to toilet facilities for uh, long periods of time, um, refusing to give uh, prisoners access to clean water for drinking and washing, verbal abuse, psychological torture that includes uh, sleep deprivation, solitary confinement, intimidation, and uh, there were a lot of injuries that were um, that were uh, visible on on the on the detainees and the prisoners, including scars, burns, bruises. Um, and then also some medical cases like shoulder joint dysfunction uh, and uh, disturb disturbances in the collarbone. Um, it's really it's really hard to explain all of that. When I worked on this report, it was really difficult for me to gather all this information. And uh, it's been ten years now. I'm working in the human rights uh, field, and I'm, I'm Bahraini, and I'm working on 
but I have many human rights situations, so it's uh, it's personal sometimes, and it touched um, some family members of mine, uh, and it was really really difficult. I still remember in 2011 when I was in, in an interview with a with a, a torture survivor when he was telling me that in fact he was sexually abused. And that was in 2011. Um, a lot of things happened behind prison bars. Only a little, a little bit um, came out, and we know about them. A lot were were hidden forever, and um, it's it's quite difficult to to be talking about this. But uh, we're always hoping that we will do something all together to bring this to an end in everywhere, in every corner of the world. Thank, Thank you so much. much. Thank you, Asma. Thank you so much. You raised very important um, questions and elements about torture, talking about brutality and the inhumane use of torture and, and force against uh, protesters. And something you mentioned also is very important when you said security forces were using torture against probably every person that got into prison and was detained after the uprising. Um, it's very astonishing, and I think this is probably something co in common we have with the other countries, and that's why I would like to ask Kala Afash from the Syrian Center for Media and Freedom of Expression. Ala is the Research and Studies Department Coordinator at the Syrian Center for Media and Freedom of Expression. This, uh, the SCM is um, a Syrian organization, independent, non-governmental, non-profit, um, established in 2004 and worked uh, to defend uh, op uh, oppressed individuals due to their beliefs and opinion, and to promote human rights and supporting developing independent critical and professional media. Ala, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I would like to thank you for this invitation. I'll try to make the best of the possible way. I will try to be brief as possible. I hope that I will have enough time to present our report. Our report in Syria, the legal, social, and economic issues. In the fact, it is a result of the experience of its own experiences and its own feelings. A group of wide ranging studies and reports of the past years. It did not aim to bring this report to restore the legal and the legal obligations. ولكن كان الهدف الأساسي من, من, من العمل على هذا التقرير هو استكشاف ما وراء تجربة التعذيب كيف يمكن للتعذيب أن يعقد حياة ضحايا يدمر حياتهم ويترك آثاره طويلة وقصيرة المدى سواء كانت جسدية أو نفسية آه كما أن التقرير سلط الضوء إلى افتقار الدولة والسلطات ذات الصلة على الآليات القانونية التي قد تحمي أو تعوض أو تستعيد الوضع القانوني والأهلية للناجين من التعذيب أوضح كذلك كيف أن سوريا يعني لا تنتهك فقط القانون الدولي والقانون العرفي الدولي الذين يحضران التعذيب ويدعوان إعادة تأهيل الناجين فحسب كم لا هي تخرق أيضا قوانينها وأحكامها المحلية ما يعرقل إعادة دمج الناجين من التعذيب اجتماعيا وطبيا وصحيا كذلك برهن التقرير أن سوريا تنتهك الاتفاقيات الدولية أيضا بعرقلة إعادة تأهيل الناجين من التعذيب ولا يتسع حقيقة يعني الوقت لذكر جميع هذه الاتفاقيات شارك في كتابة هذا التقرير حوالي 15 شخص من ضحايا التعذيب وكان هناك أيضا ستة خبراء من خلال مقابلات يعني شبه منتظمة أجراها باحثين مدربين يعملون بمركز السوري الإعلام وحرية التعبير قدمت جميع روايات الناجين نظرة ثاقبة حول كيفية تأثير التعذيب التي تعرضوا لها على إمكانياتهم الاجتماعية والاقتصادية في وقت لاحق أيضا أضاف الخبراء الاجتماعيون والصحيون والقانونيون لهذه الروايات من خلال تسليط الضوء على كيفية يعني كيف يمكن للعوامل الاجتماعية والتدابير القانونية في سوريا أن تعرقل إعادة التأهيل الاجتماعي والاقتصادي للناجين من التعذيب أيضا تم تصميم البحث بشكل يراعي تنوع المشاركين من حيث العمر والجنس والموقع 
يعني قد يظهر أثر التعذيب على الحراك الاجتماعي والاقتصادي الناجي منه بأشكال متعددة لذلك سلط التقرير الضوء على ثلاثة جوانب رئيسية هي الجوانب الصحية والاقتصادية والاجتماعية بالنسبة للأثار الصحية فإن الأثار الصحية للتعذيب مسجلة جيدا وكانت موضوعا لأبحاث ومداولات متراكمة سواء من مركز السوري أو من مراكز ومنظمات دولية أخرى وقد تؤثر على الناجين من التعذيب جسديا وعقليا وعاطفيا قد تكون إصاباتهم مؤقتة أحيانا أو دائمة وهذا يعتمد يعني بشكل أساسي على مستوى الإصابة التي تعرضوا لها وما إذا كانوا قد عورجوا في الحال يعني أثناء خروجهم فورا من المعتقل أو لا لذلك تختلف إصابات التعذيب باختلاف التقنيات المستخدمة يمكن أن يكون التعذيب جسديا في أغلب الأحيان ويشمل الضرب والسعق بالصدمات الكهربائية على سبيل المثال وكان ممكن أن يكون أيضا تعذيبا نفسيا بما في ذلك الاعتداء اللفظي والإهانة أوضح جميع الخبراء الذين تم مقابلتهم في هذا التقرير باختصار أن التعذيب قد يسبب عدة أعراض مثل تشتيت الانتباه، الأرق، واضطرابات الأكل، مشاكل التواصل مع الآخرين على المدى الطويل يعني وعلى المدى قد قد يسبب التعذيب الاكتئاب، اضطراب مع بعض الصدمة، القلق، الكوابيس، أحيانا انعزال اجتماعي والشعور بالغربة وانعدام الثقة بالنفس وقد تتطور جميع هذه الأعراض لاحقا في بعض الأحيان إلى محاولات انتحار قد تكون الآثار الجسدية للتعذيب قاسية وقد تؤدي في كثير من الحالات إلى إعاقات مؤقتة أو دائمة حيث يعاني معظم ضحايا التعذيب من آلام عضلية مستمرة وآلام في الظهر والرقبة والمفاصل والركبتين بسبب وضعيات الجلوس التي كانوا يجبروا على القيام بها أثناء فترة الاحتجاز خاصة الناجيات الناجيات الإناث حيث تترافق هذه الآثار الجسدية لتبقى مع الضحية لفترات طويلة جدا كما تنتشر التهابات الجهاز التناسلي النسائي بين الإناث وعدوى المسالك البولية بين الذكور غالبا ما تتطلب الكسور الناتجة أثناء فترة الاحتجاز إلى تدخلات جراحية روى الناجون من التعذيب الذين شاركوا في هذا التقرير بأنهم ما زالوا حتى الآن يعانون من إثارات من أثار الإصابات التي أصيبوا بها أثناء تعرضهم للتعذيب على سبيل المثال قالت إحدى الناجيات أن صحتها تدهورت يعني حيث اعتادوا على إضافة الكافور إلى الطعام والشراب في سجن عدرم ما أدى إلى مشاكل تناسلية وأخبرتنا أنها ما زالت تتلقى العلاج حتى الآن وأصبحت عقيما وتعالج على نفقتها الخاصة عندما سئل المشاركون عن يعني عن سبب عدم سعيهم للعلاج في السجن اقروا بعدم ثقتهم في الطاقم الطبي الذي يقدم لهم الخدمات الطبيه قال احد الناجين على سبيل المثال انه لم يكن امامه سوى الاعتقاد بان القرص المقدم له بالفعل قرص باراسيتامول لان اصابه قدمه كانت خطيره واخبرنا ايضا ان الرعايه الطبيه شبه معدومه لم يعطي اي مريض اي دواء أما الطاقم الطبي فكانوا في الأساس جلادين كانوا جنودا يعني ولم يكونوا أطباء وقال يعني لقد كانوا غير إنسانيين ولم أكن أثق بما يسمى بالطاقم الطبي بالنسبة للآثار الاجتماعية يعني قد تمنع العديد من العوامل من الناجين من التعذيب من التحدث ما جرى أثناء فترة الاحتجاز خاصة النساء قد تكون هذه الحواجز أحيانا اجتماعية أو ثقافية أو كلاهما في معظم الحالات وبدلا من حصول هؤلاء الناجين على الرعاية والدعم الذي يلقى توقعاتهم غالبا ما يماجه الناجين من التعذيب وصمة العار والخزي خاصة في المجتمعات كالمجتمع, كالمجتمع داخل سوريا في بعض الأحيان تم التخلي عن بعضهم من قبل عائلاتهم وتطليقهم أو طردوا من مجتمعاتهم لا تزال وصمة العار مشكلة في سوريا حتى الآن حيث أدى الخوف من الوصم إلى حرمان الناجين من التعذيب حتى من الوصول وتلقي الدعم الصحي والاجتماعي والنفسي تم تحديد وصمة العار كأحد أهم الأسباب التي تمنع الناس من تلقي الرعاية والدعم الضروريين 
يشعر الأشخاص الذين يعانون من مشاكل الصحة العقلية بالعزلة والتصنيف يعني تلخص إحدى الناجيات من التعذيب تجربتها على النحو التالي قيل لي في المحكمة العسكرية كان سيكون من الأفضل لو تمت إدانتك بتهمة الدعارة بشكل عام لا يظهر الناس أي رحمة تجاه أحد يسألوني البعض لماذا احتجزوك بينما يسألوني آخرون عما إذا كنت قد تعرضت للتحرش الجنسي في السجن حل كثير يعاني العديد من الناجين من التعذيب من التفكك الأسري أيضا وكذلك فشل الخطوبة والعلاقات العاطفية كما أن تعذيب واحتجاز النساء في سوريا هو موضوع يعني تقارير متراكمة وكثيرة كانت المحتجزات من مختلف الأعمار مع أو بدون أطفالهن وصفت إحدى الناجيات مرأته على النحو التالي شاهدت تعذيب سجينات أخريات وتذكر أن فتتين تحت سن الثامنة عشر ضربتا بباب حديدي تقصد باب الزنزانة وسالت الدماء من رأسيهما كما تقول سيدة حامل واحتجزوا امرأة وابنتها البالغة من عمر ثلاث سنوات معا واعتقلوا كذلك نساء مسنات تجاوزن خمسين رأيت أيضا الكثير من الأطفال كانت هناك طفلة في الثالثة من عمرها في الزنزانة المقابلة لزنزانتي وكانوا يرهبونها ظلوا يضربون والدتها لإجبار الطفلة على الاعتراف كانوا يعذبون الأم أمام طفلها للحصول على معلومات من الطفل مثل أين ذهب والدك؟ أين ذهبت والدتك؟ بالنسبة للأثر الاقتصادي وفقدان الدخل قدم الناجين من التحذيب المشاركون في هذا التقرير بتفصيل ظروف فقدانهم للدخل والآثار القانونية إضافة للآثار القانونية اللي عقدت فرصهم المحتملة المضي قدما في حياتهم الأثر الممتد قد قد يؤثر أيضا على عائلة الناجي من التعذيب ذكر أحد الناجين كيف تعطلت أعمال major implications on their families especially when a family أنه سيتم استدعاؤهم لاحقا إلى المقر الأمني الذي تم احتجازهم فيه بالإضافة إلى ذلك قد يتعرض الناجون من التعذيب للتمييز في أماكن عملهم حيث شرحت ناجية أخرى من التعذيب كيف أصبحت عاطلة عن العمل بعد إطلاق سراحها بعد ما قل الرب عملها يعني عقوى الإفراج عنها من مهامها الوظيفية تدريجيا حتى فصلها عن العمل بشكل كامل بتمنى أكون هيك عملت إحاطة كاملة للتقرير التقرير جدا صراحة كبير حاولت جاهدا أنه فقط أعمل استعراض لا 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 أهم النقاط اللي وردت فيه وأنا جاهز لأي سؤال شكرا كثير شكرا على شكرا لك و I think uh, I think it's very important that you mentioned the uh, the report objectives and you said that it 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 ends at exploring what's beneath torture. And, and thinking about the lack of rehabilitation mechanism as, as a way of another form of violation um, is very important as well. I think uh, the report is very important and I would like to invite all the participants to, to read it because uh, it's impressive in its content as you, you, you just mentioned. Um, you've mentioned the direct effects um, on the victims and the Uh, long-term effects as well, and the focus on, on female victims as well and their, their problems. Um, so I, I'd like to thank you for that. Um, and now I think we should give the floor to Mustafa Saadoun. Uh, Mustafa is the director of Iraqi Observatory for Human Rights. Um, and uh, the Iraqi Observatory for Human Rights is um, um, uh, aiming to document um, all the human rights violations across Iraq. Um, and issued the report uh, and appeal since 2014. It's a member of IOHR, including their director, working on a voluntary basis. And uh, they have a network of uh, over 70 volunteer observers. Uh, Sadun, the floor is yours. Shukran. Shukran, we are شكرا لمركز الخليجي على هذه الفرصة اللي تحدث بها عن البحث حتى ما أطيل عليكم بخمس دقائق
البحث اللي عملناه في المرصد العراقي لحقوق الانسان كان عنوانه التعذيب في السجون العراقيه الاساليب الممنهجه لعناصر الامن. آه العراق يعني نستطيع القول منذ آه تقريبا 70 عاما آه او ربما اكثر بقليل آه تعاني السجون فيه من عمليات تعذيب آه ممنهجه او شبه ممنهجه الأنظمة النظام الملكي النظام الجمهوري في فترة النظام السابق وحتى النظام الحالي الذي يفترض بأنه نظام ديمقراطي كل هذه الأنظمة مارست التعذيب البحث اللي عديناه الإطار هي إجراءات الحكومة حول التوصيات بعد 2003 ديمقراطي كنا نتوقع بأن السجون العراقية ورغم عمليات التأهيل والتدريب والمبالغ الكبيرة التي صرفت على محققين على كل في هذه السجون استمر ومنذ عام 2006 ما وصلت حكومة كان هناك شيء في بروبلم في في صعوبه بس بالاتصال بالانترنت عم بيقطع شوي يعني عم نقدر نفهم اللي عم تحكيه بشكل عام بس عم بيقطع باماكن معينه it's cutting off in, in a few places when you were speaking but we're, we're a bit struggling to hear everything <تصفيق> Can you try again now? 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 وست ما كان الاعتماد على آلية المخبر السري التي استخدمتها حكومة سيد نوري المالكي هذا المخبر السري هو أي عملية بلاغ من أشخاص سريين ضد شخص يتم اتهامه بأنه ينتمي إلى الجماعات الإرهابية وبالتالي زج في السجون العراقية عشرات الآلاف من الأبرياء الذين لم يعرضوا على المحاكم وعلى القضاة لسنوات طويلة وحتى هذه اللحظة هناك من هم لم يعرضوا على القضاة خلالها عرض هؤلاء إلى عمليات تعذيب حكومة العراقية ولا الأمم المتحدة عندما كانت بل لاغات إلى المبعوث الأممي الأسبق السيد مارتن كوبلر بشأن عمليات تعذيب لم تلتفت الحكومة الأمم المتحدة ولا حتى الحكومة العراقية ولا حتى وزارة حقوق الإنسان قبل أن أن تحل فبالتالي صار إعادة تأهيل جديدة لعمليات التعذيب شبه الممنهج في العراق ما سيطر تنظيم داعش في عام 2014 وبدأت عمليات التحرير أيضا وصل العشوائية في المدى عمليات القوات الأمنية العراقية تعتقل كل من تشك به دون أوامر قضائية وشاهدنا بشكل كبير في مقاطع ديو موثقة في تقارير صدرت من المرصد صدرت من رايس ووتش أمستي منظمات أخرى توثق عمليات التعذيب حتى التعذيب المداني البحث اللي عملنا عليه في المرصد العراقي لحقوق الانسان 
كان يتضمن عمليات التعذيب في العامين أو العامين ونصف الأخيرين أي ما بعد انتهاء التحرير للأسف تمارس تحديدا في المحافظات المحررة التي كانت تخضع لسيطرة تنظيم داعش وبعض المحافظات الجنوبية عمليات تعذيب شبه ممنهجة وربما تكون بأوامر بعض القيادات الأمنية العراقية لماذا أقول أنها by some high-ranking officials in Iraq. And we think that this is the case because those officials disregard the complaints of the families of victims and does not allow inspection or monitoring visits to the detention facilities. Uh, بشكل مفاجئ ما يعني ان هناك تعذيب حقيقي ويمارس بشكل شبه منهج يضاف الى ذلك كله انه لدينا في العراق مشكله انه السجون سجون لدينا تابعه لوزاره الداخليه سجون تابعه لوزاره الدفاع والسجون تابعه لوزاره العدل هذا عدا السجون الاخرى التي يقال ان هناك سجون سريه. ما بعد عمليات التحرير ايضا حدثت عمليات تعذيب لكن هذه المره ليست بسبب اعمال عسكريه او ليست خلال فتره حرب او او اعمال قتال. حدثت اعمال التعذيب ضد نشطاء بدات من عام 2018 عندما بدات الاحتجاجات في محافظه البصرة أقصى جنوب العراق ومن ثم في كربلاء توفي الطفل في إحدى سجون محافظة كربلاء بسبب التعذيب كان الطفل عمره 11 أو 12 سنة عندما أيضا استمرت الاحتجاجات في العام 2019 كانت يعني نشاهد حتى عمليات تعذيب ميداني من خلال القسوة والضرب التي تمارس عندما يتم اعتقال النشطاء في السجون ايضا يمارس عليهم تعذيب، بالتالي نحن نتحدث عن تعذيب شبه ممنهج في السجون العراقيه لا تستطيع او ربما تتجاهله الحكومه كل الحكومات العراقيه لا استثني واحده تتجاهل هذه العمليات، حاولنا في المرصد العراقي لحقوق الانسان من خلال البحث اللي عملناه ان نسلط الضوء على المشاكل الحقيقيه ماذا يحدث داخل السجون؟ تحدثنا مع ذوي ضحايا، تحدثنا مع اشخاص تعرضوا للتعذيب لكن ربما نحن لا نستطيع يعني كمنظمات حقوقيه لا نستطيع ان نمنع التعذيب داخل السجون، لكننا نستطيع ان نضغط لمحاسبه الاشخاص الذين يمارسون التعذيب وبالتالي تقل حالات التعذيب وتقل سطوه هؤلاء على على السجناء ايضا للتعذيب بالمناسبه دوافع دوافع ربما تكون دوافع سياسيه دوافع مناطقيه دوافع شخصيه للاشخاص المعذبين وايضا دوافع قد تتعلق يعني هناك عمليات ابتزاز كثيره تحدث في السجون العراقيه للسجناء ولعوائلهم ومن لا ومن لا يخضع للابتزاز يعذب كل هذه العوامل تؤدي الى التعذيب شبه الممنهج او الممنهج نستطيع القول في السجون العراقيه، اعتقد الضغط الذي يمكننا ان نقوم به هو ان نضغط على الحكومه لمنع الاشخاص الذين يقومون بالتعذيب من الافلات من العقاب. انا اعتذر جدا عن الاطاله واتمنى ان اكون قد قدمت ولو شيء قليل، شكرا. Shukran Sadun, shukran Lailak. I would like to thank you for your contribution, and I think you raised very important uh, points and and some of the challenges challenges that probably the special reporter will benefit from. Like for example, the the um, the the different authorities that are in charge of prisons, and and the 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 field torture is very important as well. The blackmailing as as a way of of torturing the families and 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 um. I think uh, you raised very important uh, elements, and I think many of the the countries we're we're talking about today have uh, lots of things in common. Um, now I think uh, we will go to uh, Al Qas uh, contribution. Um, uh, unfortunately and understandably, uh, Julia uh, 
uh, Ligner from Al-Qas uh, couldn't join us today, um, and uh, therefore my colleague uh, Michael will be um, uh, presenting her contribution. Michael, the floor is yours. Yes, good afternoon. And just before I start, uh, Julia had prepared her uh, her comments uh, last week, so I'll just be reading those out. I just wanted to offer my condolences to the family of Ala al Sadiq, uh, her friends, her family, and, and everyone concerned by this terrible car, car crash uh, that happened over the weekend. Um, so, uh, Torture in Saudi Arabia, intervention by Julia Legner from Al Qast for Human Rights. Torture is a widespread and systematic practice in Saudi Arabia and has been used by the authorities for many years. There are no or insufficient legal safeguards to prevent torture in the kingdom and impunity for perpetrators is prevailing. We have, we, I'll just have documented. Sorry, I will, I'll slow down. Uh, we have documented new trends of torture since the access of MBS to, to Crown Prince, which I will elaborate on a little later. First of all, torture in Saudi Arabia is used during interrogation to extract forced confessions, but also as a form of punishment in, in detention. The methods of torture and ill treatment that we are documenting in Saudi Arabia include, but are not limited to, beatings, floggings, electric shocks, sleep deprivation, exposure to extreme temperatures and stress positions, waterboarding, force feeding, incommunicado and prolonged solitary detention, sexual assault, and threats of raping or killing victims' families' relatives. Furthermore, impunity for perpetrators of torture prevails, as there is no independent monitoring and complaint mechanisms in place of detention. In spite of reports by detainees indicating that they have informed courts of acts of torture which they've endured, investigators, investigations are rarely conducted into such allegations and coerced confessions, confessions are routinely admitted as evidence against the accused. Saudi Arabia does not have a criminal code which creates legal uncertainty, meaning that the legal I'll, I'll slow down. This will make the this will make the, a bit longer. Saudi Arabia does not have a criminal code, which creates legal uncertainty, meaning that the legal definition of crimes, as well as the determination and severity of their punishment, rests on the judge's discretionary interpretation of Sharia law. The absence of a penal code violates Article 11 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Moreover, Saudi legislation does not explicitly define torture in accordance with Article 1 of the Convention, creating a legal void that makes the elimination of this practice challenging. Presently, the only legislative provision prohibiting torture is Article 2 of the Code of Criminal Procedure, which states that an arrested person shall not be subjected to any bodily or moral harm. Similarly, he shall not be subject to any torture or degrading treatment. This provision offers no adequate definition of torture, does not specify the applicable punishment for the offense, nor does it provide for the different modes of participation, uh, such as complicity, instigation, and giving orders. In, in addition to incriminating separately acts of torture, the law should provide adequate sanctions that reflect the gravities of these, crime, of these acts. The 20, uh, 2017 counterterrorism law further facilitated the practice of torture as its articles 19 and 20 allow for indefinite periods of incommunicado detention, increasing a detainee's vulnerability and the likelihood of him or her to be subject to forms of torture and ill treatment. The concluding observations of the CAT following the country review in 2016 state, the failure of Saudi Arabia to provide minimum procedural safeguards during detention and interrogation and its judicial practice of admitting coerced confessions into evidence strongly suggest that the practice of torture is officially endorsed. Similarly, after his visit to Saudi Arabia in 2017, the former UN Special Rapporteur on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights while countering terrorism, Ben Emerson, stated that the theoretical protections enshrined in law appear illusory in practice. Over the past years, al Qast has in fact dominated, uh, documented new trends of torture in unofficial places of detention perpetrated by a squad of people directly affiliated to Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman. 
In November 2018, reports emerged of the brutal torture of detained women human rights defenders in different prisons, such as the Al Mahabith prison in Damam, Dahban Central Prison in Jeddah, and Al Hayr political prison in Riyadh, as well as unofficial places of, ten- of detention known as the hotel and the officer's guest house, where they were subject to interrogation. The women suffered beatings, flogging, and electric shocks that left some of them unable to walk or stand properly, with uncontrollably shaking hands and with marks of torture on their body. Younger women human rights defenders were also sexually assaulted by being kissed or hugged by male interrogators, stripped naked, or groped and beaten on sensitive parts of their bodies while handcuffed. At least one human human rights defender is reported to have attempted suicide on several occasions as a result. This is a particularly worrying development given that the torture of women detainees was previously unheard of in Saudi Arabia. Moreover, women human rights defenders reported that their torture was overseen by Saud al Qatani, a close advisor to Mohammed bin Salman, which suggests that the torture operations are now being conducted by a special squad associated with MBS himself instead of, or as well of, as the al Mahabith intelligence services, which are already notorious for subjecting detainees to acts of torture. More recently, al doc- documented cases of individuals being detained in the basement of a royal palace, which is made up of makeshift wooden cells, temporary offices, and a clinic where prisoners are sometimes able to identify and talk to each other. According to al sources, the prison is personally run by Saad al Katani and Mahir al-Mutrab, who also reportedly participated directly in the torture of detainees. One such example is that of Suleiman al dawaish a man close to the more former crown prince, Mohammed bin, Salma, uh, sorry, Mohammed bin Nayef, who was kidnapped in broad daylight for a critical tweet against MBS. He was handcuffed, shackled, and flown to a royal palace where he was interrogated and beaten by a high-ranking Saudi official about his tweet. The following steps should be taken to eradicate the practice of torture and ensure that the perpetrators are being held to account. Reform the legal system by promulgating a criminal code, prohibiting secret and incommunicado detention and remove all legal provisions that allow for or facilitate these practices and enshrine into domestic legislation a definition of torture in line with Article 1 of the UN Convention Against Torture. Criminalize torture in full compliance with the UN Convention Against Torture, ensuring that penalties reflect the gravity of the crime, including different levels of participation and that superior orders cannot constitute a defense for acts of torture. A seat to the optional protocol to the committee again, to the Convention Against Torture and establish a national preventative mechanism, launched through prompt and impartial investigations into all allegations of torture and ensure prosecution for the alleged perpetrators. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you very much. Um, I think one of the main things we take from um, this statement is. Um, um, how the involvement of Saudi officials were, were in torture um, proved to be cross-borders as well, not only inside Saudi Arabia. And we have lots of things in common between all the reports that probably they, they uniform in their cruelty. And, and the use of secret prisons is, is, um, is proven in, in different countries, uh, for instance, the basements and the hotels in Saudi Arabia. And, and the same in, in Iraq, and I believe the same in Bahrain and Syria. Um, um, this will take us to the questions and answers, and I would like to thank all the participants and the contributors for their uh, valuable um, comments and contribution. And I'll leave it for my colleague Gerard to um, give the final word and probably open for a couple of minutes for questions and answers. Gerard, the floor is yours. You want to take some questions first, or, or shall I do a quick, uh, quick uh, final um, comment? Let's let's see if we have something in the chat box uh, first. Um, if we don't have any comments, then probably we can. I'm I'm sure that there will be questions, and and uh, since we have <laughs> Niels Melz as special rapporteur with us, I think we should uh, draw benefit. And, um, and ask as well some questions to him. I personally would like to know more about the Iraq visit because I think it's it's a fundamentally important one. Um, okay, if you wanna lead on this, the questions and answers for five minutes and then probably you can conclude. Okay. So 
Any any question to any of the panelists, including our special rapporteur with us? Who wants to come in on this? If not, I do ask uh, Niels um, to uh, tell us a little bit more about the Iraq visit, because I think it would be an important precedent to reopen um, uh, visits uh, to countries. Um, and uh, maybe if I ask at the same time, since you mentioned that Yemen and, so um, and Syria are difficult because they are countries with conflict, we have, of course, on those two uh, Human Rights Council mandates and, and to what extent you see a space to follow up on the recommendations that are there in those, uh, in those bodies uh, specific to torture and accountability. Um, thank you very much, and, and, and thank you to the speakers uh, who have very courageously, you know, presented the situation as they, you know, uh, and, uh, and have reported very valuable information. I think um, I cannot, you know, uh, overstate how important your work is, precisely because the access for international monitoring mechanisms is so difficult. So uh, th this is extremely important. Um, uh, I, I will certainly, you know, keep this report um, very uh, and, re and read it uh, again very carefully. Also, whenever I analyze situations that are related to these, to these, um, uh, and cases, individual cases related to these countries. Um, by and large, what you what you reported confirms the, also the information that I can you know derive from the individual complaints I receive and that I transmit to the government. Um, um, some of those individual cases I have received responses from the government, but they have not been satisfactory. Uh, they and it's impossible to you know when a government reports back. Oh yes, we have even when they report back, we have actually investigated this case and we came to the conclusion that there is no violation. There is no way for me to actually follow up and verify whether that information that we received from the government is correct. So, so uh, clearly visits, on-site visits are indispensable. Um, and I, 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 I commend Iraq for having, you know, uh, extended that invitation to my mandate during the uh, last Human Rights Council session, the four to six session in March. And uh, so now we're in the process of, of, of consulting with, with the authorities, but also because it will be very important to see, uh, to ensure that we have full access um, uh, to, to all the detention facilities throughout the Iraqi territory. And that plays into the question also with regard to Syria and, and Yemen. Yes, you're right, there's obviously there's the Syria commission and so on. I just want to say as far as my mandate is, report, uh, is concerned, when I conduct a country visit, it's a very important that I have access to all places of detention. Um, because uh, when I then do, uh, report to the council and to the general assembly about the situation in the country, I have to be able to have a realistic assessment, a full assessment. And that's why I always refuse to visit a country where I only get selective access. I mean, even, you know, let's say a case like the United States where they give me access to their prisons, but not to the supermax prisons and not to Guantanamo, I cannot do this. Uh, and all my predecessors is all, have always refused to, do, to carry out visits like that because it will immediately set a precedent by which states believe that they can give only selective access to my mandate. And that obviously in a country where the government controls only part of the territory or where there is you know, actual active hostilities going on where we can, for security reasons, there is just no way we can actually carry out a, a comprehensive uh, a visit. Um, that's why there is some hesitation. I think with Iraq, um, that should be possible. Uh, it is just something that needs to be uh, prepared very carefully. I cannot say much more at this stage, except that I'm extremely enthusiastic uh, that this invitation has come and that this opens a door that we can actually carry out a visit, uh, but it obviously needs to be uh, uh, prepared very carefully. Um, yeah, uh, maybe I'll start, I'll hold it here and, 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 and I'll, I'll, I just want to thank, again, if, just in case I don't get another chance, I want to thank the speakers very much. And I just want to validate you know, their work and, 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 and express once more how, how valuable it is to my mandate and certainly also to other mandates uh, you know, uh, at the special procedures uh, section. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Niels. Uh, uh, unless uh, colleagues tell me that there are other questions, I would uh, maybe just share a few comments on, on what we've heard uh, over this day. Um, and I want to start with uh, the tribute to Allah al Sadiq, Sadiq um, from Aixt. Why? Because I think this meeting is, in a way, also paying tribute to her work. Um, why is this meeting so important? Why is her work so important? and will continue to be important. Because I think sometimes when we talk about this particular region, at least in Europe, we have the impression we speak about outer space, that there is a sort of inherent conclusion, well, of course, human rights are not the same as in the rest of the world. And I think this is wrong, and this has to be contested. And I think her, her work contested that view. It said very clearly, this is not outer space. And it said very clearly, they are victims that deserve justice. And it clearly said that this has to be treated. The region has to be treated the same way as other regions. Countries in the region have ratified universal human rights treaties, including the Convention Against Torture. They voluntarily walked into a room and space. So you cannot expect when you walk into that room and space that you are treated with a different set of standards. And I think her voice was very loud and clear that there are human rights that have to be respected in this region and we can't treat it as outer space. So I think in discussing today the issue of torture, we pay tribute to some extent to what she stands for and what she worked on. And we will have to continue doing this. I think part of this is also what uh, Niels Melzer just said about the mandates of the United Nations. They have to be relevant to the situation in the region. It is indeed good news if a special rapporteur on torture can visit Iraq. It is an opportunity for us as activists as well to address the issues there. Uh, for far too long, we had no special rapporteurs um, going to the regions. We had the very dysfortunate experience, and I hope we will see this differently with your visit to uh, Iraq, the dysfortunate experience of invitation, disinvitations, invitations, disinvitations to the Special Rapporteur on Torture for Bahrain. And today, 10 years later, still no Special Rapporteur's visit. So we hope that this will be different. Why is the topic of torture so important? And I really thank the Gulf Center to have worked with its partner on these reports. Um, I think because there is a perception that this is just a humanitarian issue, a side issue. But if I listen to you, if I listen to re uh, read reports on the region, it's clear, torture is a centerpiece of the human rights drama of this region. It's not a side issue. It's not just in a line of, of hierarchy somewhere a humanitarian issue to be taken off. It has to do with victims. And I think you all, I like this, you, you, you spoke about the victims of torture because sometimes when we speak about the prevention of torture, it sounds like an abstract thing, like a car or something. No, uh, what torture does, it destroys people. It destroys societies. It destroys your rule of law if you want to have one. I'm not sure the countries want to have one. It destroys democracy. It destroys everything in a way of the values and ethics of a society. So I think it's very important that if we want to move forward on this region, we have to recognize victims. And sometimes some of the countries with whom we at the OMCT, for example, can engage in, in a certain form of discussion or dialogue, even in those countries, what is missing is the recognition of a problem as a start and the recognition that they're victims. I can't develop cure or medicine if I don't have a disease diagnosed. And what is happening all across the region is a blatant denial of a problem and a disease. So why is this? Well, my assumption is maybe because torture is wanted. Torture is not the bad apple from the tree. It is not the exception to the rule. We've heard in many countries, um, uh, including today, about um, stress positions, about assembly lines when you enter a prison where you're denigrated from the start. Those things are developed. They are thought through. They are not coincidental. And I think the title of this overall report on Bahrain, but it applies to all, impunity is the rule. Yes, the DNA is impunity. 
And this is what has to be challenged, whether it is through universal jurisdiction cases, whether it is at the United Nations through, for example, the Syrian mandate, including the, the mandate in New York on preserving the evidence for domestic jurisdiction. And you could say the same thing is needed for Yemen. And the same thing might be needed for some of the other countries. The issue of torture is, is not coincidental, it is intentional. And I think this is why this region, contrary to the original belief that, well, of course, it's not the same standard, it operates differently. Contrary to that, it needs precisely the attention on the torture issue because we have to change it. And of course, the torture issue in the region, if I listen to all of you, is so deeply connected to the overriding problems the role of the intelligence services, the role of military intelligence, uh, the allegiance being not to the rule of law, but to a leadership. It is linked to the problem how terrorism is abused. The definition of terrorism has something like spreading terror and fear in the general public to coerce a, something, a movement or an opinion, whatever. If you look at the terrorism laws in this region, if you look how it is applied, it actually fulfills the terrorism deficient themselves. And what we need against terrorism is unity, is unity in we reject the values of terrorism that target the very values of human rights. And I think you gravely undermine those values if you use terrorism in such abusive ways. And for long, I have had hoped that the UN counterterrorism structures speak out when their authority is abused. And finally, your reports speak about dissent that is targeted through torture. We know that torture has different forms, that torture might be, may be applied on ordinary criminal suspects, on the marginal, on whoever it is. But I think part of the picture that torture is wanted and impunity is the DNA, is the targeting of human rights defenders who, like in the case of Saudi Arabia, even themselves are subjected to punitive torture and detention. There is a right to defend rights as a basis for the human rights treaties that exist. Here, clearly, such right doesn't exist. There's no recognition of victims. Victims that come out have to take courage. They might face reprisals. Those who speak out on their behalf, like defenders, are targeted themselves and even torture themselves. So if you look at this picture, it's a pretty grim picture. It deserves much more of our attention and it deserves much more attention at the UN Human Rights Council. Yes, we have the eminent group on Yemen. If you read their report, torture is everywhere. Yes, you have the Syria Commission of Inquiry and the AAA mechanism in New York. It's all about torture. And if you look at the Iraq secret places of detention, uh, torture being used in, in arbitrary preventive detention, uh, it is a serious issue as well. If you look at Bahrain, yes, there is an ombudsman, yes, there is a special investigative unit, but what is its impact? Where are the torture convictions? They're absent. And I think some of the UN processes, like the UPR, are insufficient for those. There needs to be a discussion on the region that if you want to be part of the international community, if you want to be part of the Union Rights Council, if you want to play there, you have to be held to account for the same rules. And I think this is one of the messages I get from listening to you. There is no outer space for torture. There is accountability for torture and we have to insist on this. And I'm actually hopeful from this meeting because years ago when I started my human rights work, I have not heard this voice as loud as I've heard it today and as we hear it. And we, I think, oh, Allah al Siddiq, uh, that we continue raising this uh, for the years to come until there is change. Thank you. Thank you, Gerard, for, for concluding this event. And I would like to thank all, all the participants and contributors and the special rapporteur and yourself for, for joining us today and all the participants. Um, thank you again. And I think this meeting is concluded now. Thank you.